Uh, my name is Ron Edwards. Today I'm going to talk to you about advanced parameter completion. So how to how to get IntelliSense to help work for you for your commands, even for other people's commands, you know, commands that you didn't design, how you can add your own completion in. So I actually don't have any slides. Uh, I took the last one out this morning because I found they, they took too much time and I was just they were they were pretty boring and I covered the same stuff in the demo code. So we're gonna jump straight into it. <laughs> but um, actually, you know, what I'm talking about, obviously I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, but you know, I have just a little demo command here where show date time completer and to be able to get that uh, completion results to show up like that and to be able to dynamically change um, and to, to really, really help add a little bit of polish to your commands. We're gonna start uh, we're going to very, very briefly cover using validate set to do this. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. You know, in, in the old days, you know, years ago, PowerShell version three came along, and one of the nice things, if if a parameter had a validate set attribute, you got tab completion in IntelliSense for free, kind of. So it wasn't really what validate set was. It's not its main purpose to provide argument completion like that. It's really for data validation. But as a side effect of that, you got IntelliSense. So. Uh, all of this code is going to be available after we're done. So you're going to notice there's a few regions and code that we just skip over. Like I'm not even going to really cover doing a static validate set. I'll show you that, but I'm sure everybody's familiar that's in this room with, you know, creating a static validate set around uh, a parameter. But if in the past, the problem with static validate sets are they are static. You have to know the values you're going to put into them at compile time, at, at your function or command definition time. And that a lot of times doesn't work so well. A lot of times you need to know that information at runtime to provide uh, dynamic validate sets to your users. So the way to do that, of course, is with dynamic parameters. And by the way, can everybody see that? Is that a good size? All right. So you know we have just a real simple, this is what using uh, dynamic parameters to create uh, dynamic validate sets looks like. It looks like a lot of code. It looks kind of scary, but if you're uh, if you've done anything with dynamic parameters, you're, you're going to recognize what's going on. Uh, you start out, so what we're going to do is create a function that has a single parameter. It's going to be called folder name, and it's just going to get the, it's going to list the director or the, the folders at the root of the C drive, right? So in the dynamic param block, we do a directory listing of the C drive, and uh, we, we pull off just the folder names. And then a dynamic param block in a function, its job is to return a dictionary of parameters that have been set. Nor a lot of times you, you depending on uh, user provided values at the command line, you may create a parameter that only makes sense in that, you know, for like get child item, you can directory and file uh, or switch or dynamic switches that are added if you're in the file system. Um, you get a code signing switch if you're in the certificate provider, stuff like that. So in this case, we're just going to create a parameter that, that is created at runtime every single time. Here's where we create the parameter dictionary that's going to be returned. And here's where we actually return the dictionary at the very bottom. And then in the middle is where we define that parameter. So, you know, when, before we define the parameter, we're going to have to tell it the attributes that we're going to add. So in this case, we are, you know, we create a collection and then we add to that collection. This is a little bit more verbose than it has to be, but I, I feel like this is a little more readable to understand what's going on. So we create a parameter attribute. This is the equivalent of having a bracket, parameter, open and close parentheses, just an empty parameter attribute. And then we're going to create a validate set. So this is the equivalent of, you know, if you had a static validate set, having the validate set inside the brackets and in the parentheses, spelling out all the, the values. And here is where we create the parameter and add it to the dictionary. So, and the only thing this function is going to do is just return the parameters that were passed to it. So, if we come in here, oops, and don't overwrite the function, but instead show dynamic validate set example, folder name. So, you can see this is the C drive's a little dirty. Actually, I have some random folders I created when, uh, when I was going to try to cover a bug that used to be in validate set. But you have to take my word for it, this was dynamically generated. If I went in and, and deleted a folder off the root of the C drive, this would change with it as well. And 
if you had version three or four or early, early versions of version five, then this part right here might not have worked exactly as you anticipate. It, it wouldn't put quotes around uh, anything in a validate set with a space. Uh, I do have a workaround. Uh, I can't really demo it here because it is fixed in the current version of PowerShell. But what we're going to cover next uses the same type of workaround. So anyway, that's, that's what it looks like to, to create a dynamic validate set. So the next thing I want to show you is it's the last thing we're going to do on validate set. And it's really a way to, it's really, in my opinion, abusing validate set, taking it completely past what its, what its intention or what its uh, use is for. Um, but for the longest time before I knew about argument completers, what we're going to talk about next, I always wanted a way to use a validate set the way that argument completers are used, the way, you know, like when you're working in with normal PowerShell commands and they give you that IntelliSense, but you're not forced to pick what's there. I, I used to always look for a way to do that, and obviously argument completers are the way to do that, but there is a way you can do it with validate set, again, using dynamic parameters. I'm not saying this is a good idea, but um, it doesn't use reflection or anything like that. Essentially what we're going to do, if we look, so this function is going to do the same thing, except it's going to allow, and let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Like I, I want, show dynamic validate set example. You know, maybe I want to be able to put in wildcards right there and, and have that actually bring back those two, those two values. That's not going to work when you're using validate set the way that we just did because PRO uh, asterisk is not a valid folder on there. Validate set is doing its job and it's not allowing me to in input that. But if you want to do that, it would look something like this. So here we're doing a dynamic parameter and this part right here is exactly the same as the previous one. You know, we create, we get the list of folder names, we create the dictionary, we start to create a, an attribute collection this part right here is exactly the same where we create the, the parameter and we add the attributes to it and add it to the dictionary. The difference is this part right here. So a little bit of background. When you, when you interactively type a command in a PowerShell, the completion engine in the background, to do its job, it needs to know as much information about that command as possible. So internally, it's, it's essentially calling like get command to get the metadata for the command. So it needs, you know, because it needs to know, hey, you know, Maybe, maybe they provided like for get child item, maybe they provided a certificate path or certificate store path. So I need to know that code signing is a switch parameter that's, that's valid here so that it can actually complete those parameter names. So when you're interactively typing on the command line, when it's trying to get the metadata for this command, it's going to internally call the dynamic param block multiple times potentially. I mean, you, you don't really get to control how often it calls that. So when you do that, you know, the my invocation automatic variable, it has a property on it called command origin. It has two possible values. It's either internal or run space. So when PowerShell is calling that on your behalf to try to get command metadata information, it sees it as, uh, an in, you know, it was called internally. PowerShell itself called this to try to get some information. So what we're going to do here is we're going we're gonna to lie to the engine. When it's doing it internally to try to get parameter completion information, we're going to tell it that you need this validate set. And then when the user actually, when you press enter and you submit your command, that's when the command gets run for the last time. It runs the dynamic param block, it runs your, your begin and your process and your end blocks. And then in that situation, we're not going to add the validate set attribute. Now, again, I'm not saying this is the best idea. There may be reasons that I haven't even thought of that it's, it's a bad idea. But it does seem to work. So if we show dynamic validate set suggestion and we come in oh, one other thing notice and the other one to show the you know that that end block was much simpler I just told it to show the PS bound parameters well in this case because we're not letting validate set do its job we're actually on the hook for doing the validation to make sure that the user put something in that is valid so of course you know if you try to use suggestions it's gonna be the same thing with argument completers if you allow the user to type anything and you just provide IntelliSense you know, to help them out, you're on the hook for validating that they actually put, that they gave you valid input. So anyway, let's come back down. So it comes up with the IntelliSense. Now can I type in that? I can. So, you know, that, that's a way to, 
again, it, it's abusing validate set. It's not using validate set, set for its intended purpose. Um, and the way, if you have PowerShell version 5, you really shouldn't try to use this for any reason. Um, PowerShell version 5 offers argument completers uh, an easy way for everybody to use them out of the box without it doing anything special. So we're going to, I keep talking about these argument completers. I guess let's jump into them and, and actually talk. Uh, before I do that, any questions on using validate set to get IntelliSense or, nope, all right. So argument completers. So what is an argument completer? An argument completer is, uh, it's essentially, it's, it's a script block. PowerShell is going to invoke it uh, when, when it goes to look to see, you know, when, when you're typing a command, PowerShell behind the scenes is doing all kinds of completion events. So when you start to type get command, you know, it, it's, as you're typing behind the scenes, uh, there's a, a global function called tab expansion two that's getting invoked that ends up passing everything you just typed along with the cursor position and all that stuff into a helper function. And that helper function is pretty complicated, but it ends up figuring out whether or not the cursor's on what's probably a command or a parameter name or a parameter value. And behind the scenes, these uh, completion events are, uh, are occurring. And so when you go to start typing, um, well, that should have popped up something. There we go. Um, so at this stage, you know, we could have registered what's called an argument completer, and PowerShell would have would have known that we've we've given this script block um, the responsibility of showing the user what valid parameters are available. And the completers themselves, they're they're actually just they are just script blocks. So we're going to make a very very simple one real quick, and you register them. <clears throat> You tell PowerShell about them with this register argument completer command. So uh, real quick, this, this presentation is mostly geared towards version 5, but almost everything I talk about here does apply to version 3 and 4. But you do have to do something special. That tab expansion 2 function, or yeah, the function that I mentioned, in version 3, it doesn't provide an easy entry point into having these custom argument completers. There's a, a module, the easiest way to, to get this available, there's a module called Tab Expansion Plus Plus. It's created by a PowerShell team member. I believe it's the same guy that uh, made PS ReadLine. And essentially, so when I call register argument completer here in version five, this is a, a, a native commandlet. But if you have that module, uh, it's gonna essentially do the same things behind the scenes. It, it sets up, there's uh, dictionaries of argument completers that, uh, that all this stuff goes into. So what we're going to do, we're going to register an argument completer for a command called dummy command, which isn't a command yet. Its definition is right here. And all we're going to do is output two strings. All right, a script, uh, an argument completer script block, it, it's supposed to return uh, completion result instances. And we'll talk about what those are in just a minute, but it turns out, you know, PowerShell let you do a lot of stuff, sometimes it'll get you in trouble and it turns out that a regular string can just be coerced into a completion result. We'll, I'll show you why you probably don't want to do that in a minute. But this is an argument completer that's just going to tell it that there are two strings that are available. And I just ran register argument completer. That command has not been defined yet in my session and that's okay because all register argument completer did was put this completer into uh, a dictionary and it was associated with the dummy command command name and the parameter param the parameter parameter name. So let's read that in and type out dummy command. And when I type in parameter, I hit space, nothing happened. If I hit control space to actually tell the completion engine, you know, to, to bring up the IntelliSense window. Um, you notice, I, mean, I, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but I'm calling it out so you should notice it in just a second. There's no little icon right here, that's blank. And that's because we just let those strings get coerced into completion results. The completion results are what are used for command names, for parameter names, for variable expansion, all that stuff. And you're supposed to tell it what type of completion result it is. And so in this case, IntelliSense saw that this wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a parameter value completion. So it, that's why it didn't automatically show it. But let's go ahead and pick one of these. Now, if you notice, I just picked that one. There's no quotes around that. So it's kind of like what I was saying earlier, there was like a bug in validate set. 
Well, this actually isn't a, that, that would, in version three or four, there was a bug in validate set that would do this. This isn't actually a bug though. You, you want to be able to, and you can, and we'll, I'll show you in just a second how, you want to be able to control exactly what is returned to the command line as that parameter value. So it is on you. If, if it's something that needs to be quoted, it's on you to get it quoted. So another problem with this, I can type in gibberish and I can press tab and it goes through them. So what's happening there, that, com that argument completer script block, it's doing exactly what it was told. Every time it's invoked, whatever it returns, that's what the IntelliSense is going to show. So we told it to output those two strings. So it doesn't care what I have. I can start this with a G and you know, that should come back with the, the good night string. But when I hit tab, it goes hello world in that order. So every single time that script block is invoked on behalf of PowerShell, it's going to, to output everything in that order. So if we come in and let's first fix the quoting problem, right? So here's that same completer. This time we're gonna, we're gonna fancy it up some. We're gonna take each one of the, the strings that we wanted to output and for each one, we're going to do a really bad check for how to, whether or not it needs to be quoted. All this is doing is taking spaces into account. There are other reasons you would want to quote a string like parentheses and any, any other number of them. But for this instance, we're going to treat, you know, we, we save that string off and then we determine whether or not we need to quote it. And if so, we add quotes. And then we're going to end up calling, uh, creating a new completion result. And so completion result new. So it has two constructors. We saw earlier that it'll obviously allow just a regular string. And when you, when you give it just a single string, it ends up for, the, for these three values that take strings, it just uses the same one for all of them. But here's something that's really neat about them. They allow you to have different values. You know, this first one, this completion text, that's what's actually going to be put on, that, that's the value that will be put with the command, whether or not that's up in the script pane or down at the, uh, down in the command line. The next one is what the IntelliSense menu is actually going to show you. Next we have the type of completion result and if you're using register argument completer to, to do an argument completer you're probably always, I don't want to say you're always going to, but I can't think of a time you wouldn't tell it it's a parameter value completion type. And then you get to provide tooltip text. So in this case we're just going to put the word tooltip in parentheses so you can see that it is doing something. So we do the same thing, parameter, and now you notice hello world and good night moon, they don't have quotes around them, but when I press enter to select one, they do have the quotes. We still have that problem though where it's not taking into account whatever we've typed. So in order to do that, um, you know, that, that argument completer, when it's being invoked, it has a lot of arguments that are passed to it that give it information about the current command that's running. So instead of just telling you what they are, we're gonna, I'm gonna demo it real quick. What we'll do, we're gonna run, just monitor a little log file here, and we will create an argument completer for that same command that's just gonna output stuff to this log file that we're watching. And so we can come in now and again, try not to overwrite that dummy command parameter. And so if you look up here, uh, five arguments were passed into it. The first argument is a string and its value is dummy command. So it turns out that first argument is the, the command name. The completer is made aware of what command it is acting on behalf of. The next one is a string and its name is parameter. So you know that matches up with the parameter name. The second argument is the, para the current parameter name. Uh, the, the next one, this is a, this one's blank right now, so if you come over here and type in gibberish and then invoke that again, you'll see that the value for the, the third argument is gibberish. So that's the, the word to complete. That's what the user has typed in. The fourth one is a, is a command AST object. So you're, you're given the entire abstract syntax tree of the command. So if you want to do something super crazy and advanced, you can have at it. You know, it gives you all the tools you need to to do make completers that depend on other parameters that the user has typed in at the command line or you know do lots of stuff with it. The last one is a, a hash table and that's uh, you're going to see that referred to in a little bit as the fake bound parameters. So you can see where it's got parameter one there. If I come in and give it 
you know, uh, we'll do out variable, just one of the common parameters and call that again. You can see down at the bottom where it is, it has those, those are available. So I could do a check inside the completer to see, you know, maybe I need, maybe I care what's in out variable. So I can check and see that. Now it's called the fake bound parameters. It's not truly, you know, it's not doing everything that the real parameter binder would do once you submit a command. If you were to try something like this, you know, just, just put a command inside parentheses and, and call it, even though echo var is going to do essentially the same thing as, or effectively the same thing as just putting a string out, it's not going to bind that. It's, it's not considered a safe value. You know, you could, you could have anything in there. You maybe could call new item or something like that, and, and you don't want to actually do that until the user presses enter, so it's not going to necessarily bind everything. But if you looked in that, uh, in the AST, you would be able to see everything that was typed. So if you had to, you could still go in and do the, the hard work of looking through that. So knowing that, let's now go back and modify our simple completer. Doesn't look quite as simple anymore, but this is, the, this is exactly the same as the last time, except we have this param block now so that we can use the commands easily by name instead of having to you know, do args 0, 1, 2, or 3, 4. And the only other difference is right here we, we do a little filter because remember the script block is going to be invoked and whatever this script block sends out, in this case we're going to construct completion results, but whatever it sends out, that's what's going to be returned in that order. So if we put a filter here to say, you know, these original strings, they need to be like whatever the user has said. And we have a wild card on there, so if, if the word to complete is empty, then it's just saying if it's like any of those. So let's run that dummy command parameter and now let's see what happens let's hit escape the test right here is so it, it went straight to goodnight moon it didn't go to hello world gibberish so I, I promise I'm pressing tab and control space nothing's happening because it you know that doesn't match any of the completion results and this is what what you know I would expect to happen with normal commands that have argument completion so any questions about simple argument completers? All right. So let's, let's take that kind of to the next level. All right. So now what we're going to do, I, I want to show that you can, you can actually uh, add argument completers to commands that you don't even own, to native commands if you want to. I mean, you, you want to be careful with, with that. But um, so I picked git command to kind of pick on. There's, you know, I ignore the title, improve git command. It, it actually, git command as what it does is, is amazing. All right, there's nothing, I, I, I have no faults with that. But it, it seemed like it would be a good command to kind of pick on to show how you could have completers that, that depend on other parameters that have been, that are being passed in while you're typing on the command line. So git command, you know, it obviously, it has some completion that happens natively, right? So if I type in module, and bring this up. This takes a little while. Uh, it, you know, it it was able to complete that. Uh, it knew the, the the available modules. Now, if I type in name and hit space, now this one's kind of funny. You know, I had to hit Control Space to bring it up. And if you look at that icon, that's not the parameter value icon. But still, it provided completion for this, and it is filtered on just that module. If I if I didn't put any modules there, then it should have just had all the commands available. I can do the same thing with noun. Uh, you know, this time around, it's it looks like it's the default completion isn't doing parameter value. So again, you have the blank there, and I had to hit Control Space. But this is still filtered on module. But you can't do something like parameter name and try to bring up completions for that. That's not going to work. It doesn't provide parameter name or parameter type completions. So we're going to try to fix that. Now. We're going to skip over the one that's labeled first try. You guys can look at that later. And it's just going to be the, this exact same completer here, uh, but just with not quite as much. But what we're going to do, I want to actually first, before I embarrass myself, we have some helper functions. This wouldn't have worked earlier or later. We have one called re-register completer. What this is going to do every time you know we, we uh, modify that completer script block, this thing's job is to just go in and for every single parameter or not every single parameter, but all of these parameters, it's going to register this completer to the git command command and to each one of these variables. So we'll be able to just, instead of having this for each, we'll just call re-register 
command. Um, new completion result, this is just going to be, this is a helper function and you're going to want to do this probably. Remember how that simple completer earlier turned into something that's not quite so simple, it's a whole bunch of lines. This makes it so that you can just you know, take a string and send it to new completion result. It'll figure out if it needs to be quoted. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, this is mostly from the tab expansion plus plus module. I did add one thing. This isn't the best practice here. It saves a couple lines for the demo, but this is actually going to take the word to complete into account from its parent scope, you know, where it's being called. Uh, just be aware of that if you try to take this and use it somewhere else, uh, since you, you, know, you probably don't want to do that in your real helper function. But we'll read that in. So now we're going to come down, and here's kind of the, the neat thing. Since we know, since the completer will know the command and the parameter it's working against, you can do something like this where you use the exact same argument completer code for something, you know, for, the, for one command you can just have the same completer code. And in this case, you know, we, we have a check in the beginning. This isn't strictly necessary, but, you know, if, if this completer accidentally got registered to another command, we do a little check to see whether or not we should just return without putting any results out. You know, if this accidentally got sent to another command, you don't want to confuse the output with uh, completion results that don't make sense. The next thing we're going to do, we're actually going to call git command on itself, and we're just going to splat the fake bound parameters uh, into it. So one thing we're, we're going to do, though, whatever the current parameter that's being operated on is, we're going to add a wildcard to that because otherwise, you know, as we're typing the command, if we type dash module and we type three letters of a module in, that's going to mess your completion results up later when this gets splatted because that would actually splat those first three letters to get command. Um, and then we're going to, depending on what the parameter is, we're going to do something, uh, depending on what the parameter name is, we do something a little bit different. So if the current parameter, remember get command has a parameter name parameter. If it's parameter name, then we're going to figure out whether or not uh, the parameter type has been specified, and if it has, we'll filter on, I mean, literally, whatever git command returned earlier is stored in this valid commands. So we check the parameters dictionary for each one of those, and then all the values, we filter them, we sort them alphabetically and get, get them a unique value, and then send it down to new completion result. Parameter type's pretty similar. Uh, we're going to, just in that case, instead of the, the getting the keys off those parameter dictionaries, we're going to get the values and then take their types. And then if it's any other parameter, like verb or noun or name or module, we're going to take whatever those valid commands results are, whatever the, the results from in, uh, calling get command are, and we're just going to uh, select that property off of the commands. So what should happen... Question. Sure. Uh, do you have a recommendation or idea when you might want to do multiple completers inside of inside of one completer like you're doing versus registering multiple argument completers? Yeah, so uh, the question was, do I have any recommendations on when to do separate completers? You know, in this case, we're taking the exact same one and registering. And it just depends. You, you look on, on a case-by-case -case basis. So in this case, uh, you know, if I were to make a separate one for each one, there would be so much, all the code would be duplicated except for this switch statement. So it just, in that case, it makes sense. It, they're all doing essentially the same thing. They're going to call git command with whatever, whatever else has been passed. And, you know, it, it, it's just, if you look at it and it looks like you're reusing the exact same code over and over again, I would put it into one completer. I don't think it would hurt anything to have a separate completer for each one. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, this is putting everything in a global dictionary that, you know, it's, it's not... It's the same amount of work for the PowerShell engine when it goes to look up, you know, hey, I'm, all right, I've got this command with this parameter. Is there a completer available? So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it wouldn't have hurt to do them separately, but in this case, because the amount of code reuse would be incredibly high, I just chose to throw them in one. So, sure. Just say another question? Yeah, can you open that up again? Yeah, absolutely. So what is that worth? Microsoft. So that's the fully qualified command name. Uh, I mean, and to be honest, it's probably, so git command is something. So there, there's a, uh, an order of operations or a precedence for different commands. So if I were to make a function called git command, that would actually kind of shadow the real git command um, because functions are looked up first and I think aliases are looked up before functions. So in this case, this is just a way to say, uh, go to the real git command commandlet. 
Well, so let's do git command, git command, and let's see, somewhere in there, I guess we have to, uh, yeah, I see that, uh, yeah. it may have been. I wonder if it would be, hold on. No. So it, it's available from git command. And a little bit right after the, right after here, I'll show you how you can actually grab that um, information. I don't want to embarrass myself anymore up here. So we'll take that completer script block, and we're going to run the uh, re-register completer, which took that script block and, and said, you know, for git command, register this to the name parameter, to the module parameter, all that stuff. So now we should be able to come in, and we can limit this to a module. And we can, you know, we can do name. Now remember earlier the name, this was coming back with command completions. That icon was a little bit different. So this time the completer, the completions just popped right up. So that shows that it is using our argument completer. Let's actually do like verb and add. Now we can come over to parameter name. And so if this is doing its job, um, any verb in the PowerShell access control module or any command that has the add verb in the PowerShell access control module these are the parameters limited just to that. And you can look, there's not that many of them. You know, if we, if we take this and change it and just do parameter name, you'll see that it took a little bit longer and there are a ton more that come up. Same thing for parameter type. So we can actually take parameter name and let's say our name, parameter type. And you'll see that out of all the commands in PowerShell, again, if this thing's doing its job, then if you're looking at commands with the parameter name name, then it, you know this, this says all the commands there, there is a switch parameter, some, at least one switch parameter somewhere that has the parameter name, at least one scalar string parameter, and at least one array string parameter. And actually, let's get the counts. So I don't want to cover too much about what's, you know, this, this is just a, a modified version. We use group object under the parameter name and parameter type. Uh, conditions in the switch block but for the sake of time we're gonna I'll just kind of demo what it does a little bit more and you can take a look at it in a little while but we're at we're gonna add counts to that so git command parameter name and so now it has counts in there and you know of course I, I didn't show this but when you press enter you know it didn't have the count information that was we could tell the list to show something different than what was completed and when you do look at this, it, it seems like it'd be kind of useful to be able to sort it maybe on the count. And you can, you can do that. You can put whatever kind of logic you want in that completer. So if I put logic in that said, take a look at that word to complete. Now I ended up doing an exclamation point here because if you do just the less sign, then the completer won't, won't work. But if I put that in, I told it to change the way you sort it. So now it's sorting by the, the, the count, the greatest number of parameters versus the, the least number. So you can see that you know all these common parameters obviously show up the most, and these counts should change if you know if we as we add different things to filter on parameter name, and let's this time do it from uh, in ascending order. But you can see all the different parameters. So instead of the 292 or whatever, it looks like we're down to like 24. That have that, and that's you know just an example of a, a way to have a com to show completers that can take other parameters that are being typed into account, and in, you know in real time. So, uh, any questions on on that? All right. So next, I want to talk very very briefly about a different type of completer. All right. So. Those were, I'm going to call them normal completers or just completers. There's also something called a native completer. Native completers are geared more towards external, like executable applications. So things that aren't PowerShell commands, but they still have arguments, like the, the net.exe utility. You, know, you can use it to start and stop services and to, uh, to access shared drives and stuff like that. So the big difference from the completion standpoint is it has different arguments that it receives. 
So when you take a look, we'll do that thing again where we have a little debug log up. And this time we're actually going to, uh, so this is going to output to that debug log, but it's also going to output some completion results. This is geared toward, this is for IP config. It's, its arguments are really, really simple, so I chose it. But the way you tell it that it's a native completer, you call register argument completer, you give it the command name, and in this case, you, and then you give it a native switch. So with normal completers, the parameter name is what's required, and the command name is optional. So I, I did kind of skip over that, that with normal completers, you can actually say, uh, anytime you come across a, a username parameter, I want you to run this completer. Uh, and as long as there's not a completer registered for username with a specific command, then that one will win out. It'll end up, you know, you, you can have it to where a, one, a certain parameter is always has a certain completer that gets executed with it. Native completers, though, they don't, it doesn't take parameter names into account. You register it to a command, and then you provide this native switch. Let's take a look at, so now if we call ipconfig, and I have to do tab or control space. But you can see over here, this time we got three arguments. So the first one, um, the first one is the word to complete, which is useful. Uh, the second one is the command AST. And then the third one is the cursor position, in this case 17. So you don't get the, the command name included there. You can grab it from the command AST. You don't get the, the uh, parameter name. Again, you can determine that yourself. And you also don't get the fake bound parameters. Um, the command AST, like I said, though, if you want to take the time to look into that, you could get all that information out of it. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, in, in this case, what I did was you know, looking at the command AST and counting the number of elements that were here. And I don't want to spend too much time on this. Honestly and truly, if you're, if you're interested in these native completers, the tab expansion plus plus module, even if you have version 5, if you go take a look at it, they have a lot of native argument completion. Because it gets, it gets a little bit crazier, you know, because you have, with native commands, you might have, like for net exe, you have one, you know, the first parameter determines what your next set of parameters is. And you have all these, these trees that, of uh, parameters that end up. You know. But I wanted to mention this because in just a second, we're going to use native completers for something that they, I, they probably weren't intended for. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. So, yeah, I think we have a little bit of time for this. Let's talk about the completion order precedence. So earlier I said you can override the completion behavior of any command and any parameter. Well, I may have said any parameter. If I did say any parameter, I was actually technically wrong. If a parameter has, if it's an enumeration type, or if it has a validate set, you don't get to override that. You can put an argument completer, register one all you want, but it's not going to let you do it. And if you think about it, it makes sense because in those cases, you know, you have to pick one of the valid values, and so there's no need to even return a complete, uh, completion result. Um, there's also, next up, after that, PowerShell will look for the type and, and the, the attributes. After that, it will check the normal completer dictionary. And whatever command you're running, if there is a, a complete, uh, an argument completer that's registered for that command and that parameter combination, then it will use that completer. If there isn't one registered for that, it'll check to see if there's a, a completer registered just for the current parameter name. If there is, it'll use that. So after checking that regular dictionary, if no results are returned, it may have found a completer registered, but if no results were returned from either of those checks, then it falls down to the next step here. And the next step here is something I didn't talk about, uh, and this is a version five only thing. I think they, well, so there is an argument completer parameter attribute. So if you don't wanna call register argument completer, you can actually put your argument completer the exact same syntax that we were using earlier with the script block. Just decorate your parameter with it when you're defining your function. But if you have one of those set and then you call register argument completer later, it should be the case that that uh, argument completer you registered would win out because this is called after that. Next, there's a, the completion engine has some hard-coded completion behavior. So earlier when we were looking at git command and you saw how name and noun had completion stuff, that was in there. Uh, if you ever notice like when you call new object, it does type name completion, all that stuff. There's essentially, it's, it's like a giant switch statement that says, well, 
you know, none of these other things return completion results. So is, it, is the command name get command and is it this parameter? Okay, then I, I know what to do. If there still by this point hasn't been any completion results returned, then it falls back to those native completers that we just talked about. So it checks that dictionary. So even for a normal PowerShell command, it'll check the native argument completer dictionary for that. And then if you still don't have any completion results returned, then it just kind of, you know, it does the whole, um, let's see. You know, it'll just fall back to completing for the, the current file system, right? And in here, there's some demo code that kind of shows registering multiple completers and then and going in and, and, and watching how they're called and, you know, it sets up the little log file on the side. But instead of going through that, I want to actually show you a way that you can, I, I call it abusing native completers. I, I doubt, I mean, it may be the case that native completers were intended to be able to do this. It may also not be the case, so, you know, the results may vary. But um, I think this is kind of cool, and in my session on Wednesday, I, I show kind of, you know, an actual use for it. So I've got a, a real simple, very rudimentary uh, function that I wouldn't trust outside of this demo that goes through the AST that's passed and tries to do like some fake parameter binding, you know, like what, what the user actually passed in, right? And it will allow, it will look at the command metadata if it's available, but it'll also allow like a parameter that doesn't exist in that metadata to, to kind of, you know, be bound. Uh, we do this, you know, we're gonna set up a little log over here. And then what we're going to do is, you know, I'm creating a, a command that has, this just show native completer extra info. It's going to have two parameters. And down here, this is the, the important part. We're going to register a native completer for it. And inside the native completer, we are going to, you see, you know, the command name's not available. Remember the, in the param block, it's only going to get three parameters passed to it. So the command name, like in a normal completer, is not available, but we'll get that from the command AST. And one thing to note about this, native parameter, so with a normal completer, you could register, uh, if an alias is called, the normal completion, in, the completion engine will be smart enough to know, like, you, you called this alias, but you were actually looking for this command, and when you're inside, it, uh, it'll pull the right completer, essentially. With a native argument completer, you're kind of stuck. If, if you make an alias after the fact, it's not going to get called here. It's literally looking for whatever command you just typed, it checks the dictionary. So it checks for the alias name. And if it's not there, it doesn't run the completer. You can register your alias if you'd like. But next it goes through and calls that helper function, the parse parameters. And it takes the cursor position into account because it, it needs to know what the current parameter name is as well. Then we get the parameter name from that. That's just, you know, what the... Uh, helper function output, we get the fake bound parameters, and then we're just going to output all that information. So this thing doesn't do anything except output the information. So show native completer extra in, did I not, maybe I didn't uh, define that, hold on. All right, so we can come in and we can type parameter one, and you can see, so we still have, we have that information. We have the command name up top, we have the parameter name, the word to complete, you know, I can type that in. Um, you could see earlier, you know, this is just for that little helper function. You see that, you know, it's bound as true. It's treating it like a switch statement because it saw that, you know, there, there's a parameter name, but there's no uh, corresponding, no value that, that matches that. But what's neat, so you can, you can do that, right? And we can come in and say parameter two, which was something else. So you can now see in the fake bound parameters at the bottom what's, you know, that it knows something's there for parameter one and for parameter two. And the logic could be changed so that it, you know, if it knows where the cursor is and, and nothing's been provided yet, it, it could just not put that in the bound parameters. What's neat, though, is you could say something like fake parameter, and you can do that. And so, you know, it'll, it'll you know, do there and another one. And so you can see in the very bottom here where it's, it's treating them, you know, as you're typing them, uh, you could actually have your completer go through and check for, oh, I've got a question. I'm sorry, I missed how you're doing the thing on the Oh, so that's just, all I'm doing there is I create at the very top here, uh, I just create a file, and then I do, uh, 
uh, get content wait and I'm just doing it in a separate process right here so um, but yeah I mean that, that's that's kind of neat uh, running let's see how, what time we have we got a couple more minutes so any questions about this I actually do have a, a kind of a use case for this uh, in my session on Wednesday and if anybody's curious about other stuff with this you know you can use it and again might not be the best idea you know I do a lot of stuff that's just playing around at first and then hopefully good ideas come from that so sure do you have any suggestions on how to uh, parse the arguments for native commands not really so yeah I'm not super familiar with doing the uh, with that stuff what I would say the tab expansion plus plus module if you look into that they have uh, and, and it's on GitHub. They, uh, I've seen other completers that other people have made. So they'll, you know, there, there's a ton of native command completers. So yeah, my my, uh, I actually originally wasn't even gonna, uh, you know, cover native command completers. And I was like, well, I kind of need to do that. And then playing around with it was when I discovered this. This was like two weeks ago, and I was like, oh, that's pretty neat. I need to put that in. And I was able to take it and apply it to something else I was working on. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I'm not. You know, it's just gonna be you'll. The command AST will tell you, you know, you can easily, let's see, let's come in and modify this guy to, so we have access to that AST outside of the completer. So with any luck, so if we do, what was it, show native? complete our extra info. We'll treat this like it's net stop, uh, you know, WAU serve, right? So when we do that with any luck, yeah, so we have the command AST there. So this is what we would have had access to inside that completer. So you can see that, you know, it's a get type somewhere. It's a command AST, and so on a command AST, you have, you know, there's a git command name, but you also could just take this command elements. So you can see that there are three elements and that, that's right because we said, you know, command name, the word stop, and then, uh, you know, a service name. So, you know, you could always say that the first command element should be the command name. And the next one, you know, if you were doing one for, uh, for like for NetEXE, you could check the next one and you could see, all right, it's stop or it's start. So I need to go in and start doing stuff you know, I need to get a list of services. And, you know, you could say, well, it, it stops, so let me go get a list of services that are running. And, you know, you can, you can get as complicated as you want with that. The one thing you want to be careful of, anything that's expensive, IntelliSense will time out after, I don't know, it's like a couple hundred milliseconds. So, you know, you don't want to be the, the cause of it, like, hanging. Sometimes, when it, sometimes it times out and it's super quick and it's, everything's responsive again. Other times it kind of hangs and has trouble stopping. Uh, so if you're doing something like expensive that's going to take a little while to, to get results for, you may want to try to cache that somewhere. Uh, what we didn't get into was how to tuck this away into uh, a module scope. Uh, if you have a module and you register your completers all inside of it, that part's easy. It should just work uh, if you want to do that after the fact. And also if you want to use it with Tab Expansion++. Plus um, Plus. And this is kind of in the notes on that last demo script. It'll explain that Tab Expansion++ Plus Plus will strip off, if you're, if you're bound to a module, it'll strip that binding and then bind it to its own module so you have access to its helper functions like new completion result and stuff like that. So it kind of covers a way that you could, you know, you can just call get command. You, you can get the current commands info and get its module scope and execute stuff in that. But, so I think that's about it. Any questions? All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, I really appreciate it.